Uh, great. So, <coughs> in the last class, we discussed this Weierbein form formalism of general relativity, and we had, in particular, uh, explained how this is how it is useful to describe the propagation of fermions. Now, um, there's one uh, little bit that I wanted to say uh, about that that we didn't talk about in the last class, um, which is this. You see, what we did was to introduce this, this this Weierbein thing in the end as a technical tool. We introduced a, an arbitrary choice of e mu a and then we defined this nice spin connection. But in the end the spin connection was completely determined in terms of this e mu a. Okay, from, by, the, by the requirement that this quantity was covariantly conserved where the covariant derivative acted uh, on the A index with using the spin connection and on the mu index using the Christoffel symbol. Okay, and that condition was enough to determine both the Christoffel symbol and the spin connection. Okay, however, you may wonder, given that, you know, this, this object seems to have a life of its own, uh, meaning you need this object in order to formulate, let's say, the propagation of fermions general relativity, you may wonder whether this formulation of the general theory of relativity where these quantities rather than the metric are the basic variables of general relativity. Okay, and interestingly enough there is. So I'm going to tell you about that just for two minutes and uh, uh, the main algebra we leave for an exercise. But let me tell you the main idea. Remember what the, what the action of, square, uh, of general relativity was. The action of general relativity was square root g times r plus blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm not even writing the constant outside. Now, let's see if we can recast this action in terms of these variables. Okay? Now, let's look at the connection firstly between g and e. Okay? g mu nu was equal to E A mu E B nu, where A, this contraction E A nu, the or oh, E B and E B, the contraction is done with eta. Okay. Now we can think of this as a product of three matrices: E, eta, E transpose. Now you know that there's, there's a famous result in the theory of matrices that the determinant of a product of matrices is the product of the determinant of matrices. And therefore square root g is simply, I mean g is simply determinant of this times determinant of the transpose for that same as determinant of the matrix times determinant of eta. Determinant of eta was minus 1, so that accounts for the minus 1 here. Okay, And uh, we conclude that this quantity square root minus g is just equal to square root of e square, where e is the determinant of e a mu. Okay? Is this clear? Notice how strange this is. What we're doing is computing the determinant of, we're doing the kind of things we try not to do. You know, a determinant we normally think of, uh, we normally think of determinant of an operator, which is a map from one space to the same space. Here, this E has one index in space time and the other index on the VR wind. And these are in some sense different spaces. But because there are as many indices here as here, nobody can stop us from taking this determinant if we want to. Okay? This is what makes, from the point of view of viewing general relativity as a gauge theory, this is what makes it odd. You see, the two indices in a normal gauge theory, which are mu and the index on which uh, the, the gauge index, A, normally have nothing to do with each other. The fact that general relativity is, a general, is the gauge theory of rotations of space time means that these two indices can be, you know, can talk to each other. And we see that, for instance, at take in, in this quantity, in this determinant. Okay? So square root of G is this, which is just E. Okay, and what about R? 
So now, but R, that's not tough because um, because we explained last last class what the re relationship was between R mu nu alpha beta and the curvature of omega mu nu. So let's let's remember. Suppose I define the field strength. to be the curvature, you know, d f, d omega plus omega, commutator omega. The usual field strength of the gauge theory. So this is, this has indices mu nu, d mu omega nu minus d nu omega mu plus omega mu commutator omega nu, this commutator taken in terms of matrices. Okay? If you remember what we what we uh, what we discussed at the end of the last class was that there was a close connection between this f and the Riemann curvature, and the close connection was what you would expect, namely that R mu nu uh, mu um, let's say alpha nu beta was equal to f mu nu a b and then e a uh, e a um, e a uh, alpha e b beta. Mm. Okay, up to a plus and minus that I kind of cannot remember. That was part of the exercise yet. Yes. Oh, sorry. Ah, the symmetric, anti-symmetric. Thank you. Thank you. Mu nu alpha. Thank you. You're right. The anti-symmetric interface. Absolutely. Okay. Great. So now, what we want to do is to look at what the scalar curvature is in terms of f. Okay? So what we have to do is to contract these indices and contract, let's say, these indices. Okay? But that is clearly up to this plus minus that I'm not going to try to get straight. It's clearly contracting this index and this index. How do you contract these indices? We then, uh, with an e. So if I, this is basically f mu nu a b, you raise a and b with the eta, okay, the metric on the here, man, and then contract with an e a mu e b b nu. Clearly up to a plus minus, that will give us r, right? As you can easily work out using these relations that we had, g is e e all over the place. Okay, so R up to a plus minus, which you guys will figure out, is this object here. So if we just wanted to write the value of the action, okay, so let me call this, this thing here R tilde. Let me by definition call it R tilde. Okay, R is equal to R tilde numerically. Okay, R is equal to R tilde numerically. Okay, however, R tilde as a logical quantity is completely different. R tilde is a function of E and the spin connection, whereas R was a function of the metric. Is this clear? So now let us look at the, uh, the Lagrangian E times R tilde. Numerically, this is the same Lagrangian as the Einstein Lagrangian. Okay, but it's logically a different object. Okay, logically, it is a function of e and omega. Now, what I'm going to do is to pre ask. Suppose I take this to be my basic Lagrangian. Uh, just one question. Got. Yeah, in this uh, integral. Yes. Uh, what's the integration measure? D four, D four x. 
it's this thing absorbs away, you know, makes a genuine co <laughs> coordinate invariant in exactly the same way that this does. Okay, so E transforms under uh, under general coordinate transformations, like one factor of the Jacobian, the determinant of E. You understand, right? Because because uh, it's E mu A, let's say. Okay, so that under Gen uh, we'll pick up del x mu by del nu, e nu a. And then uh, the me integral measure is like the determinant of this transformation. So that's the determinant of del x mu by del nu, which is the Jacobian, which exactly cancels the transformation of d for x. So this is a generally co a coordinate invariant integration, integration measure. Okay, excellent. So we, 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 we take this Lagrangian here, and now, we take this Lagrangian and we ask for its very, we, we now just, let's, let's, let's try to see what happens. We just declare that the variables of our problem are actually E and omega. And this is our Lagrangian. What will we get? Well, in order to see what we'll get, we have to uh, compute the equations of motion. Let me first compute the equations of motion with respect to E, which is baby stuff. Okay? Because, uh, um, uh, because uh, there are no derivatives of E in this Lagrangian. All the derivatives are derivatives of omega. Right? So, varying with respect to E is really simple, so let's do it. Yes? So, we are taking E and omega and omega. What? E and omega. In this formulation, they are completely independent. Okay? And if there is a dependence between them, they should come out of the equation of motion. Okay, which is fine because we have plenty of equations of motion. You see, in Einstein's Lagrangian, we had what d squared equations of motion, or really d into d plus one by two because we had symmetric. Uh, okay, however, here we have many more. Just just the equations from omega are roughly speaking d cube. It's not quite d d cube, right? It's d into d into d minus one by two. Because omega is anti-symmetric in uh, uh, alpha beta. Now, if we do this and if we get some omega, will it uh, satisfy the metric compatibility? That's the point. Okay. Hang on for a minute. Okay, first let's look at the equation with respect to E. Okay, so when we do the equation, when we compute the equation with respect to E, okay, let's uh, let's let's compute it. So what we want is the change. Let's take as a basic variable this object, E a mu with upper and lower. Okay? Then this E is the determinant of this object because this is the square root of the metric. Okay, it has a lower, uh, lower index. So what is delta E? Okay? Delta E we know is equal to E times E inverse delta E as a matrix trace, which is equal to E times E mu A, okay, times delta E A mu. So that was what we got from the variation of this object. Okay, so uh, what we got from the variation of this object here, uh, fine, we've, we've got this. Now let's also compute delta r tilde. Delta r tilde, let's look at the definition. It was um, this object here. Um, it was this object here, uh, but let me, let me flip it. So, so it's delta of f um, mu nu a b e a mu e b nu. Time. Yeah. Exactly. 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 
So I, I'll just write it in the way you're right. A, let me write this as AB and mu A. Uh, okay. Let me write it. I'm just going to make it as easy as possible. I hope I'm not missing a minus sign somewhere. I, 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 I hope I'm not missing a minus sign somewhere. We'll, we'll check as we, as we go along. Maybe missing a minus sign. Uh, anyway, let me, let me do it and then we'll correct the minus sign uh, if we go wrong. Hmm. Okay, so now this quantity here, uh, this quantity here is what? Let's, let's take its variation with respect to this object. So um, this quantity gives us, let's vary this guy. We get F mu nu A B delta E A mu times E B nu. But of course, we also have this quantity here. Now, so let's, let's work it out carefully. So it's plus F mu nu A B E A mu uh, delta E B nu. Now what we want to do is to change dummy indices, right? Because we want the same, we want to write everything in terms of delta uh, E A mu. So this has a nice delta E A mu, but I'll write this as E A mu. E A mu, and I'll write this as B nu. So then what I have to do is to switch both A and B and mu and nu. B A nu mu. But it was anti-symmetric in both. <laughs> okay? So we just pick up an extra factor of 2. And therefore, what we have is delta R tilde uh, times E is equal to, R, sorry, del delta of this object is equal to uh, Del, delta E A mu into E. And one term is just R tilde times E mu A. And then here you have plus uh, 2 <coughs> times mm, this guy, which is F mu nu A B uh, E B nu. <coughs> okay. Now, up to a sign that I'm going to leave you guys to figure out, if you don't mind. Uh, I'll take a factor of 2 out here. You know, so this is r by 2. And clearly, this is r mu nu. You see? Because what is r mu nu? r mu nu was r a, b, c, d, contract one index with one index. But these guys were proxies for the other two ind indices. And uh, we've contracted one of them. So this, once we lift, we then E, A, B, C is an R mu nu. So you see that up to a sign, which you have to do carefully, this is the same as the equation. R mu nu plus minus, of course, it's going to be minus, R by 2 G <laughs> mu. <laughs> I'm not going to try to work that sign out. This will kill you.
right. F upper mu nu has a metric in it. You're probably right, and this is probably the heart of our science. Okay, Pr Pranav is forcing me to do it correctly. Let, let me do it right. Okay, uh, he, he's right. This, this will give us our science. Okay, he's absolutely right. Uh, let's, let's be very careful. What was that object? Omega mu nu, we, as he said, we have no other met metrics in the game. So we really should look at F mu nu, and really there was an A B, let's, because that's what it was. And then E A, E A mu, oh no, what does this mean? Um, yeah, we can raise and lower this object. So we will do, yeah. This, I can raise and layer lower A and B objects because I've got eta. So E A mu is, is fine. So it's just raised with, with eta. And uh, uh, E B nu. Okay, really we should just do the variation of this object. Okay, so with, with upper and lower. As, and the important point here is that these guys all had upper mu and nu. So apart from eta's, they are all inverses of this e. Why did you want to have the variation in lower mu, right? Like e, a lower mu? I just would, so, th so that I didn't get science. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, it was just wrong. As, as, you said, as you said. See, what I'm going to do now is to remember that this object is the inverse of the matrix with the lower object. Let's, let's remember the formula. E mu a, e a nu is equal to... Uh, delta mu nu, or even better, let's put e, e a mu e mu b is equal to uh, delta a b. Okay, because we want to change the. What's really important is changing this, the space-time index to be up. Okay. Now, now let's do it correctly. Now let's take delta of this whole equation. So we get delta E A mu E mu B plus delta uh, plus E A mu delta E mu B is equal to zero. And therefore we get delta E A mu is equal to minus uh, E A mu delta E mu B, and then I multiply by the inverse. So uh, use a different index. So that mu. Uh, and here I'll do with E B theta, let's say, a mu, yes. But the important thing is the minus here. Hmm. So this is what we, wish, we, should actually, we should actually start with this guy and do this variation, okay? Both these are E with upper indices, okay? So each of them will come with a minus. That, that was the minus that was not, 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 not okay. Okay, so you do that, you get this minus. That, of course, this was the heart of the minus in Einstein's equations. Let's remember why we have the minus when we vary it in the metric. It's because variation with respect to g, the variation in the measure is with, was variation with respect to square root g, which gives us a plus in terms of g, g, lower, lower uh, variation of g lower. But variation in, Einstein, in the r was r mu nu g alpha beta, but g alpha beta was up. Because it was inverse, we got an extra minus. It's the same minus here. Thank you, Pranay. Sorry for being late. Sorry for being lazy about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so that, that's, that's basically the minus, and we get, we get back Einstein's equations. Okay? Of course, Einstein's equations where R is the field strength, is the field strength of omega with indices contracted in, in the manner that we've explained. R is basically this object here. Again, I should be less lazy. and we would have something like an E mu. 
So this is what the definition of R is. Okay, and then you can exchange the last index for an e, e index. Okay, so far so good. But there's the elephant in the room, and the elephant is in the room is yeah, what is the okay. what is the condition of of the spin connection? What is the condition of the spin connection in terms of the metric? Okay. So this I'm going to leave for you as an exercise. Exercise very. Vary this action. The omega mu a b. Okay, vary the action with respect to omega, and show that that the equation of motion implies. That omega, you know, is implies this, where this was the covariant derivative, both with respect to spin connection and with respect to Christopherson. The condition that helped us interpret, that helped us determine omega in terms of a. Okay. This equa this thing on shell, this thing tells you then that effectively this defines the same dynamical system as Einstein's equations. Because you've got the same equation of motion for the curvature, curvature, but now the curvature can be completely written in terms of a metric when we define the metric to be square of E. So if you define a metric to be G, G mu nu is equal to E A mu E, e A nu. Then we get exactly this. Then combining this equation of motion and this equation of motion, you get Einstein's equations. And moreover, there's no additional content in these equations than Einstein's equations. Because as we've seen, once we know the metric, we can, and any given arbitrary choice of the Weierbein, we can determine the spin connection. So it's not like you gain or lose either way. These are equivalent. E is this clear? Now the Just this, you get this equation, and we saw last class that this equation was enough to determine the omega. In fact, you had an exercise on how to determine it. Okay, now there is one thing here that you might be worried about, and that is this. You see, I have pretended that this is the only only action in the you know that that the whole action is just the Einstein part. But there are other terms. Okay, so what about the you know when I look at the variation? What about the variation with respect to the other terms? Now, in the variation with the, uh, in the other terms, the variation of E, you see the other terms, E, uh, for instance, if you wrote, 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 wrote down Maxwell's equations, E will just appear because there was a contraction with G. And so the variation with respect to E once again will produce the stress tensor in exactly the same way that we got from variation with respect to G. Nothing will change that. But what about the variation with respect to spin connection? Okay, this might worry you because um, we rig you might think that we've thought of this as an absolute definition. You know, in our previous way of introducing the spin connection, this was written as an equation, not something that was mutable. Okay, but if you've got variation with respect to the spin connection on the right hand side, you could have additional contributions from the right hand side. Now, okay, um, if you work out Maxwell's equations or minimally coupled scalar equations and so on, omega makes no, plays no role. It just doesn't enter the matter action. Only E and enters the matter action. So for familiar equations of motion, this doesn't happen. However, do you know of any dynamical system for which omega does enter the Lagrangian? What? The Dirac spinner. This was in a, in a way our main motivation for, for introducing this. So in the presence of the Dirac spinner, okay, if you treat this as your fundamental dynamical principle, okay, in the presence of the Dirac spinner, if you treat this as a fundamental dynamical principle, then the equation of motion 
for this quantity gets modified because there is an additional contribution from uh, there is an additional contribution from uh, uh, there is an additional contribution from the uh, derivative of the Dirac Lagrangian with respect to the spin connection and often I mean um, Often this is the best way of thinking of it. That when when you've got when you when you've got a system in which uh, um, you know if you've got a nice dynamical action principle generating all your equations of motion, somehow it's the nicest way to think of the problem. And for some some purposes, it's needed. Uh, how can this rule use uh, the subscript of the circle? There shouldn't be mu nu a. These are just completely independent indices. Okay. Now. So in principle, this connection in the presence of fermions or other any other field that will require the spin connection for formulation of, um, uh, of dynamics. Basically, that is anything with the spinorial type index, let's say a Rita Schwinger type field. Okay? Then this equation can and does get modified. Okay? And there's a problem that's sometimes called the problem. Of, I mean, this is an issue involving something sometimes that's sometimes called torsion. Okay, I'm not going to say too much more about this at this point. Uh, maybe it'll come up later in, our, in the more seminar parts of our course. Except to say that for practical purposes, this often matters very little. This often matters very little, basically because it's hard. It's very unusual. Uh, you see. The right hand in, in the presence of a Dirac equation, what you get is the right hand side of psi bar psi. Now, classically speaking, psi, which is an anti commuting field because it's from the Dirac Lagrangian, cannot have a C number expectation value. Let me say it again fermions are in their very formulation quantum mechanics. Let, let, let's try to understand why. When you have bosons, something like a photon, okay, you can make these coherent states, which have a very large number of photons in any given state, and they start mimicking classic. They start mimicking classical behavior very well. Okay, so e to the power alpha a dagger on on on, on a harmonic oscillator. Okay, behaves very near to classical, and uh, and this behaves very near to classical basically because there's a very large number of of modes excited, um, and that large number is somehow uh, crucial to it being classical. You've got modes with n, n plus one, n plus two, all these are large numbers of. On the other hand, fermion, any given state of a fermion can be occupied with either occupation number either one or zero. It's the Pauli principle. So it's very hard to make fermionic fields in any sense classical. Okay? So if you're solving classical equations, okay, you normally think of psi. E, okay, you know, so if you had the right hand side of an equation that had just a psi, you would just think of it as zero. Now, because psi is anti-commuting, you never have a psi on the right hand side if you've got a left hand side being bosonic. What you have is a bilinear. You've got like a psi bar psi. Now, there are states in quantum theories in which psi bar psi has a non-zero proper expectation value. These are states in which fermion condensates develop. And proper C number expectation value. Proper C number expectation value. These are states in which condensates develop. However, these are very quantum mechanical states. These are very hard to study states. Typically, when we're doing classical physics, in classic, classical, uh, where just classical analysis is valid, without worrying about quantum effects, you typically look for classical solutions in which classically the fermions are just set to zero. This is a quite murky topic. You know, people have tried in finding classical solutions with more generality and the status of that is not very clear. There may be something interesting here. But typically what people do, the things that have been successful, you know, that you'll find in textbooks and in well-cited papers, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as classical solutions in which you just set the fermions to zero. For this reason, practically speaking, 
that, so that extra source impacts you very little in classical analysis. Quantum mechanically, of course, it's there and it's very important. Okay, so if you're doing a quantum path integral, but of course quantum mechanics, you're never doing a path integral only over classical solutions. You're doing a path integral over all solutions. But there is some sense in which the solution may not exactly peak, you know, on that. Anyway, so this is a slightly murky topic. For many, if you are a classical physicist, you want to solve, solve classical Einstein's equations, in any solution that I am aware of that has, you know, passed any test of any being good in any way, psi bar psi is effectively set to zero. So though in principle it looks like you're modifying the right hand side of this equation, in practice you rarely ever do. For classical purposes, basically this equation, as far as I, you know, as far as, as I say, this is a subject which all, where you feel that there may be something new to do. Okay, but I've not seen anyone successfully do it. So, for, for classical purposes, at the, as, as a working rule, you can, r this thing can basically be set to zero, unless you find a new way of understanding it. Okay, you had a question? Okay, excellent. So that's all I wanted to say about, about this leftover stuff from the last class. Any questions or comments? Or we proceed to the topic of today's class. Okay? Uh, great. Yes? No, the field strength is a field strength for the spin connection. But it enters the Lagrangian, okay, only for, well, it forcibly enters the Lagrangian in a way that cannot be rewritten in terms of other things, okay. Uh, if you have a, a term in the Lagrangian which is d of this, then you can rewrite it in terms of curvature. It's only this object by itself that cannot be written, okay. So it, it enters the Lagrangian only when it enters by itself, okay. Now, for what fields is that forced on you? It's forced on you for those fields that transform in a representation of SOD, for which there is no counterpart representation in SU, SU for instance, SUD or GLD. And these are essentially spinorial representations, but not just spin half. For instance, in four dimensions, any half integer spin would necess necessarily have a spin connection, whereas any integer spin will not. More, more generally, if you're familiar with SOD representation theory, you know, you, there's a, there are those representations that can be formed by taking products of fundamentals, of, uh, not fundamentals, of vectors, and those that cannot. For any representation that cannot be formed by, ta uh, in, by taking tensor products of, of vectors, the equation of motion will necessarily involve this one. okay? But typically speaking, in familiar physics, that usually means either spin half, or if you're a gravity, you know, if you're a super gravity person, spin three halves. Spin half and spin three halves appear and both need the spin connection. Typically that's where <coughs> it comes from. Okay. Uh, excellent. Other questions or comments? Okay. So you understand this. The, the, this way of thinking is often, you know, as we said, it's really needed when we deal with fermions. For other problems, it's often not necessary, but anyway, it's sometimes useful. To introduce these Weyerbeins and the spin connections is sometimes a useful way to think, even in the absence of fermions. As you see, there's a certain elegance to it, so you should at least keep it in mind, because it may be useful for something you're trying to do. Okay, excellent. So now let's move on. So we had five, a list of five topics uh, in, our, in the seminar part of our course, and we've ticked off one of them, okay? We've, <laughs> we've gone through there, we are by. Now, I don't know if you guys have been attending all these talks on, uh, on LIGO. It really sounds exciting. Uh, so anyway, so I, 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 I want to get towards talking about that kind of stuff, about motion of black holes around each other, and so sounds very exciting, I need to learn it. But as a preliminary for that, we want to understand what it means to have conserved charges. What conserved charges mean in general? Because you know, when you look at gravitational radiation, one of the things you want to know is how much energy <laughs> is radiated in the waves. We haven't even talked about energy in general. Okay. 
So motivated by that consideration, this lecture is going to be devoted to a, uh, to a discussion of the canonical formulation of general relativity. Okay, uh, so-called ADM formulation of general relativity. And we will end this lecture or the next one whenever we get to the end of it um, with a discussion of what energy. So we're going to start a little far away from energy, uh, as you will see. But we will end up there. Okay, so what, um, what we're going to do here is uh, discuss this ADM formulation of general relativity. I'm going to follow the discussion in this book, whose title, unfortunately, I don't, I just photocopied. I just printed out the right pages. Since my students are experts at getting illegal copies of books. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, but this book by Eric Poisson, I can't remember the name, is it Toolkit for General Relativity? Relativist. Relativist's Toolkit, something like that, right. Okay, it's a very nice book for this kind of thing. Very nice book for this, this kind of way of thinking. Um, and uh, it has a beautiful chapter called the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity, which we're going to follow. In the rest of today's lecture, I am first going to outline it's a, what we're going to discuss today is usually not taught in general relativity courses. When I taught, took my course, nobody told me about it, partly because it's so complicated. Okay, so what we're going, what we're going to, um, what we, what, we, what, but, but it's useful to know that it exists, and useful to understand at least roughly what, what is going. What we're going to do in today's class is I'm going to give you an overview of what's going on just so that you get the logical structures right. I will not derive every equation I write down. Okay? And then depending on what you guys tell me, you can either look up the derivations of these equations in Poisson's book that's very clearly given, or I can go through a second class in more detail deriving the things that you're most uncomfortable with. Okay? But I don't want to start with giving every derivation Basically because that will take three, four lectures. And also you will not understand where, you know, you'll very, very quickly get bogged down in, in the details of the, without understanding. So the most important thing here is just what the structure is. It's a beautiful structure, and that's, that's what we're going to, in a seminar way, okay? I'm going to outline that structure for you, and then either you guys will fill it up, or I, I will fill it up in a subsequent class. That is for you to decide. Okay, to start with, so what we want to try to do is to find a canonical formulation of general relativity, meaning a formulation, a phase space type formulation of general relativity, okay? We want to think of positions and momenta and things like that. Okay, that, 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 that's, that's our goal. So if you think about it, the first thing you need for a canonical formulation of any, uh, uh, of any theory is a notion of time. But, you know, we were very careful in everything we did in general relativity not to have a special notion of time because we wanted general covariance. So now what we're going to do is to take a step backwards. Okay? And from one point of view, enormously uglify the, the, the treatment by introducing a kind of special slicing of space and time. Okay? However, you will see that the structures we encounter are not, not entirely ugly and there's a certain elegance to everything we do and you'll see where we go. So, I want to set up a sort of distinguished coordinate system which includes time. So, suppose that you give me some coordinates x alpha. <clears throat> the first thing I will do is to find a function, it's any function whatsoever, which I'll call t of x alpha. This is any function subject only to the condition that the normal vectors of, so, so the uh, subject only to the condition that dt, which is the normal one form to surfaces of constant t, is everywhere time-like. Okay? What does that mean? What 
What does that mean? It means that we are spoliating our space time into space like, so every surface of constant t is a space like 3 manifold. We foliated surfaces of constant t, you can think of it like an onion, the peels of an onion. Each peel is a surface of constant t. We're sort of slicing our space time into spa space, spatial manifolds. So, flat space, for instance, we could choose ordinary time. Okay? But we're not going to limit ourselves to flat space at all. So it's any foliation that does this. So, so does every space time admit this kind of foliation? Because uh, from our discussion and the uh, for Ayatollah equation, we know that uh, I mean, it cannot be globally foliated uh, if uh, there are some global obstructions. Yes, yeah. Sir. Yeah. Does every space time admit so a uh, uh, timeline? Let's see. Um. I can't, st uh, uh, of course, you know, suppose you had uh, a space time with like closed time like curves or something like that, some, some weird kind of situation. Let me think of, try to think of an example of something that would not. Um, Yeah, it's, you know, what we're demanding is that this normal nowhere goes to zero. Uh, so, for instance, it will give you, dt then becomes a normal ve vector field that is everywhere non-zero and time-like. Now, the analogous problem in Euclidean space, clearly just as a geometry problem, doesn't always exist. Because... For instance, on an S2, it's impossible to find a vector field, any vector field that is nowhere zero. And if it was possible to find some, something like this, you know, it would, it would not. So I'm pretty sure that as mathematical manifolds, even in the time-like situation, you'll be able to find situations where this doesn't occur. Even in the presence of uh, black hole horizons, possible. Uh, uh, well, you know, in black hole horizons, there are these things called nice slices which are everywhere space-like. It's not the usual slices. Uh, I s okay, I, I, I'll withdraw comment on that. I suspect that in situations where that are physically relevant, okay, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Let's restrict attention to these space, these, 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 uh, uh, these space times. Uh, I have not come, I can't immediately think of a clear example of physical relevance where it's not true, but maybe. Yeah, I'm going to assume that this is, this, this is, this is the case. Certainly for asymptotic, yeah, something with funny black holes. So certainly there'll be a very large class of space times which, which obey this. Okay, so we choose some time function and our slice of constant space will be surface of constant time. Okay, now the next thing we want to do is to choose a set of spatial coordinates in addition to time. Now in order to do that, I could just choose some coordinates, but it's often useful to think a little geometrically. Okay, so what we do is to foliate our space in, in a congruence of curves. Not necessarily geodesics. Not necessarily geodesics. Hmm? Yes, these are all time-like curves. These are all time-like curves. And we've got our lines of constant t like this. So t is defined by a function. And our spatial coordinates are defined by which geodesic pierces the point of interest. And not geodesic, which curve, okay, pierces the point of interest. So let's call these guys X size. They're labels for curves. Mm -hmm. uh, the time tangent to these curves need not be the norm. Uh, no, no, not necessarily. The tangent to these curves need not be the normal. Uh, that, those would give us these Gaussian normal coordinates that we talked about. Well, we're not going to restrict ourselves to such special coordinates. And you will sort of see why. Okay. Now, 
what we're going to do is to use these coordinates, this xi and t, this xi and t to write down the metric of our space time. Okay. So there will be t and xi mixing in. Uh, there will be t and xi mixing in general. In general, you can say not that much about what you get because we haven't, you know, given you any. I haven't given you any particular, particularly nice structures like it's not normal or something like that. So in general, the metric in these coordinates will take, I'm going to write down and then we'll see. So the form minus n b t, do they call it n square? Just I want to make sure I stick to their definitions. minus n square minus n squared uh, dt squared plus h a b uh, plus h a b d y a Oh, sorry, any any is what they call it. So that n square is uh, the norm of um, no, function? independent. It's just whatever it is. Y a are the x y a are the x y's. That's correct. Y a. <coughs> of the coordinates that label, yeah, the slice or the coordinates that label the jury sick. And not the genius of there, close. Okay, excellent. Now, firstly, what have I done here? Okay, well, what have I done here? Let's see. Um, n squared is essentially GTT. DYA, DYB, there are as many variables in HAB as there are in the metric in the Y space. And you needed, uh, for generality, also a GTA. There are D minus one of those, but the D minus one ends. So I've not done anything. Any metric can be put in this form. Okay, so it's writing it in this form is just a choice which singles out one coordinate, especially. But it's. Uh, ends in general are functions of t and y, nothing being said here. Okay, it's just a convenient way of writing the most general metric. Okay, but uh, uh, let us see, um, let us see if we can find, uh, um, uh, let us see if we can find uh, geometrical interpretations of this n and n a in terms of our, um, in terms of our uh, in terms of our uh, our curves, let's start with this idea. Okay. Um, suppose I look at the object D. Mm, Right. Suppose I look at the object d by dy. Yes. How is it different from writing it as dv plus 
something times dy a plus dy a divided b. So the thing we did in yes, that's a different form. You see, that is very nice for so I'm going to call okay. There are two natural ways of writing it. So what what the question is that there's another natural way that you might have used. Okay, uh, you might have said this is ds squared is equal to minus let's say some n tilde squared uh, dt plus a a dy or thing squared plus some h tilde a b dy a dy b. That was the question, right? And you can do this as well. However, this is not the same way, right? Okay, let's let's compare. If we want to go from here to there, the dt squared will be the same, so n square will be. No, there is a you're right. You're right. You're right. So not even the dt squared is the same. So we co we would basically equate the coefficient of dt squared to find n a n tilde in terms of n. We'd equate the coefficients of. Uh, uh, it's probably no, not even the h's are the same. Because here we will have a a a b. Subtracted from that. Okay, so there's some relationship between this h and that h. Both are possible ways of rewriting it. Both are useful in their on their own terms. This is a very useful way of writing it when everything is independent of time. Okay, when time is a killing vector, then this is extremely useful. Let me explain why. When time is a killing vector, uh, this is useful because this p now, you see, let, okay, since you've asked this, let me just, just, just say it. This way has the following geometrical, the, this is useful when you have the following geometrical picture. Suppose instead of giving you a function t, I gave you a particular vector field. Suppose I give you a vector field kmu and I define a t coordinate by the definition, okay, I define a t coordinate by the definition that, that, that del by del t is equal to kmu del mu. So t is a coordinate that moves along. So you, what, 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 what you should imagine is you solve the equation del x mu by del t is equal to k mu. And this equation tells you how you take any point. You, I have to tell you what t is here. And you'll find t along all the curves that were, are everywhere tangent to k mu. Somewhere else, I give you t, and you find t along curves that are tangent to k mu and so on. Okay? So, what this equation does is define a t coordinate up to an ambiguity. What is the ambiguity? Of a shift of origin of t in an x dependent way. Because there's no particular reason, reason for this shift. I have to tell you the origin on each on each curve. This is useful when we think of it that way because that shift turns into, if I change my origin, it turns into a gauge transformation of this gauge field. Okay, so this is a useful way of expressing this geometrical idea. That we want to define a time coordinate given a distinguished vector field. You give me a vector field, I want to define a time coordinate along that vector field if it's distinguished for some reason. Usually the way it's distinguished in physics is it's a killing vector. Okay? And then these, these y's are not arbit uh, labels not for arbitrary geodesics, but geodesics of the integral curves of this vector field. For that problem, when you have that problem in mind, this is a very useful coordinate system, basically because the ambiguities of that problem are naturally ref reflected in terms of transformations of the data of this metric. Okay? However, we're trying to look at a different problem. I have not given you a distinguished vector field anymore. What I've given you instead is a function. And for that problem, this is a more 
more natural way of, uh, of formulating. This is sometimes called the Kaluza Klein form of the metric. This is called the ADM form of the metric. ADM. The I don't even Arnold. The Arnold Okay. 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 So let's go back. Okay. So what we want to do is to understand what this NA, what this NA was. So let's look at this, 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 this thing which was del by del y a. Okay. So let's look at this del by del y a and take the dot product of that by del by del t. Okay. That is the dt dy a term in the metric. Okay. And therefore, that is equal to a k b a b. And what is that? Say again. What? No, no. We've got upper indices. What is what does this vector mean? It's it means it's the vector. It's a covariant vector. The whatever the one with upper index. Okay, whose which is 1 in the y a direction and 0 everywhere else. Okay. G should be lower. Yes. Uh, should it be 2 h a b n b? No. Because this is g a b. The T is the G, oh, yeah, the two is simply. Yeah. I think. NB. Okay. Now let me define this N to be lowered with the metric H. Okay, so I'll define NB as lowered by metric H. So what we see is that this quantity. That's my definition, my definition. Okay, suppose I take NB as NB lowered with metric H. Okay, then this quantity, this NB is the dot product between del by del T, okay, between del by del T and uh, uh, del by del uh, Y. Okay, so it represents the lack of orthogonality between these two vectorial directions. Okay, it's sometimes called the uh, shift function. This n here is basically the norm of d by dt because you want g0, 0 for the norm of d by dt, and that is sometimes called the lapse function. The lapse function. I think lapse of time, you know, how much time goes by. Okay. Now, what I want to do is to work in these coordinates. Okay. What I want to do is to work in these coordinates and to start with rewrite Einstein's Lagrangian. Okay. St working in these coordinates. So, okay. Suppose I would like the dot product between these two. What does this mean? This is the vector whose yth component is 1 and all other components are 0. Sorry, this is notation that may be confusing. When I write a mu del mu is notation for the vector whose components are a mu. Okay. So when I write del by del y a, sorry for that, what I mean is the vector which when written this way, you read off the, the coefficient. So here, what coefficient would give del by del y a? Well, if it was 1 in the, if a a upper was 1 and everything else was 0, that's what I mean by it. Uh, sorry, sorry for that if you're not. This is standard notation, but I understand your view. I'm sorry, I have, okay. Similarly, this is the vector which is whose upper component is 1 in the t direction, 0 everywhere else. Okay, fine. 
Now, I want to rewrite Einstein's equations, okay, adapted to this coordinate system. I, I, Einstein's metric, uh, sorry, Lagrangian, adapted to this coordinate system. And for that, I do the following. The first thing I have to do is some geometry. And I'm going to briefly motivate why we have such a result and then write down the result. The geometry of interest to us is the following. Suppose I've got a, a space-time and I've foliated it in, into some manifolds, into uh, surfaces of constant, let's say in this case, T. Now, there are three different geometrical ideas that we have discussed in this course. The first is the, in, is the geometry of the bulk space-time. Okay, there you have a metric, you have curvatures and so on. This we've discussed in great detail. The second thing that you can discuss is geometry induced on any particular slice. On any particular slice, you have induced metrics, you have curvatures, and so on. And the third thing that we've discussed is the extrinsic geometry of every particular slice. You remember we defined this object KAB, which was del A and B plus del B and A, which was by two space-time derivatives, but then projected orthogonal, uh, orthogonal to the membrane. Uh, we wrote it this way, but it was actually automatically symmetric, so we could just have written it as del A and B. You remember? So three different notions that we discussed, and it might seem to you that these three different objects cannot be independent of each other, because if I know everything what's happening on a slice. And I know how the slices are sort of embedded inside the space-time. Then from that, I should be able to reconstruct the space-time. So there should be some relationship between these three different, uh, between these ge these geometrical ideas. I mean, uh, so you need uh, some metric uh, on some initial surface, and you need the uh, evolution equation for the, the ambient space-time as well. Right? At the moment, we're not talking about dynamics. Suppose I give you the metric everywhere. I give you the intrinsic geometry everywhere, right. not on one slice, on every slice. Yeah. And I give you the extrinsic geometry, extrinsic curvature on every slice, not on one slice. Then I want to know whether there is some identity between the geometry of the full space time, okay, between basically the curvatures in the full space time, intrinsic curvatures and extrinsic curvatures, okay. There is, and this, I think, if you will either have an exercise or maybe it's worth deriving. This is a fun fundamental identity of this kind of thing. Um, it's a very important thing. Um, it's called the gauss kodachi relationship. And I'm going to write it down for you. R alpha beta gamma delta E alpha A E beta B E gamma C E delta D is equal to R A B C D plus
Okay. And if you take this relationship and contract indices, okay, so, uh, and where, 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 sorry, where, yeah. So firstly, what, what does all this mean? What do the quantities mean? Are alpha, beta, gamma, delta are the curvatures in space-time, the bulk space-time. Now, what are these E quantities? These E quantities are interesting. They are a verbine, but not in space-time but on the manifold, on the, uh, on the slice. And it's a verbine chosen, you know, not a normalized verbine. It's basically this. Suppose x alpha are coordinates in space time. And y alpha, y a are coordinates on your slice. Choose any one slice. Imagine you've got one slice. Then there are d coordinates here, d minus 1 coordinates here. The fact that you're on the slice is the fact that you can represent, if you can write all these d coordinates in terms of these d minus 1 coordinates. Which means that on your given slice, x alpha is equal to x, x alpha of y a. And this e alpha a is simply And it's no longer a square matrix. It's no, no longer a square matrix. There's no normalization. These are arbitrary coordinates on the slice all the time. Okay, so this is what this, this means. Okay, it's clearly a useful object for pulling back things in space time onto the membrane, onto your slice. So, what you do is to take this guy and just project this onto your slice. This is projecting into the coordinates of interest on your slice. There's no necessary connection between the coordinates on your slice and the coordinates. So you might, if you were very naive, you would think that this would give us this. That's the intrinsic this is the intrinsic curvature of the slice. A constructed out of this H in. Up out of the, of the metric, the intrinsic metric on the slice, induced on the slice. Yeah. Okay. From the, uh, this is a, what is it, constructed out of uh, the uh, induced metric on the slice. Induced metric on the slice. So this is by itself well defined. So there were three notions we wanted to relate. There was the geometry of space time, the geometry on the slice, and the extrinsic geometry of the curvature. This guy is, is the extrinsic curvature. The E alpha A are the projectors, exact projectors. They're exactly this. Okay. But not eta AB minus NAMB. Not eta AB, no. I'm, well, are they eta AB minus? These, may, these will effectively project. They will effectively project. Because you see, they're projecting onto the vectors del by del y. They're projectors in the coordinate system on the surface. You see, because what they're doing is this is an arbitrary vector in space. And this is, you're only allowing it, only allowing x to vary along the membrane. So the, these dy alphas, dy a's, give you a basis of tangent vectors along the membrane. Mm -hmm. So this is a basis of tangent vectors along the membrane. It would need to be contracted with, al with alpha. So the a, the alpha sub. Yeah, if we take any space-time index and contract all indices with these guys, uh -huh. it only picks out those paths that vary along the membrane. Yeah. Okay, so in that sense, it's a project. Mm -hmm. we're, we're pr taking the part of R that that shows up along the membrane and which is taking all those parts because these a b c d are d minus one so in some sense you're, you're looking at and projection is a fair word to use for that okay this was the extrinsic curvature and this equation is the relationship that expresses the connection between intrinsic geometry in space time intrinsic geometry on the world volume and extrinsic geometry it's called the gauss kodachi relationship. Now, for us, the thing for us that will be of most importance um, is what we get when we take this, rela this relationship and contract all indices. 
And of course, that's not a very hard exercise uh, to do, but I am just going to give it, uh, give it to you. Um, when, you, when, when you work that out, you find the following. R, so this is the Ricci scalar in the bulk space time, is equal to R3, which is the Ricci scalar on your slices, plus KAB, KAB, minus K squared, okay, minus 2, um, Yes, this K is trace of this K. Um, yeah, so minus del beta n alpha n beta. Uh, n beta, yes. Coming, just a bit. N alphas are the normal vectors to the slice in question. Okay, so this is obtained by opening out some of the some of the things that are in K. K was written in terms of covariant derivatives of Ns. And though you can write it entirely in terms of k's, for the purposes of interest to us, it's useful to take this term out because this part is a total derivative. Okay, so one can show that this is this is true. Again, any of these equations that you are interested in, or maybe I'll choose some, and we'll go through some at least token derivations uh, of some of these things. But for now. You know, suspend your disbelief. <laughs> Let us uh, assume there are no typos, and we'll <laughs> we'll proceed. Okay. Now, why is this important? This is important because this is the quantity that appears in Einstein's equations, Einstein's Lagrangian, and therefore the Einstein Lagrangian. Therefore, the Einstein Lagrangian can be written as integral square root g b4x r plus kb kb minus, minus k squared uh, minus this, 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 this del alpha n, b, n dot del alpha minus n alpha del dot n. So uh, just one question, even the uh, intrinsic uh, curvature, mm -hmm. uh, uh, curvature scalar would uh, also depend on uh, the uh, bulk coordinates uh, because uh, the metric coefficients square integer function this is a function of y and time. time. Right. So you should think of it like this, that the intrinsic bulk, bulk geometry is a different bulk geometry for every time. As far as time is, uh, intrinsic geometry is concerned, time is just a parameter. Yes. You have a foliation of three manifolds. Right. So this depends on where you are and when you are. What's the n dot in this? Uh, del dot n. Okay. And 
example, the entire bulk manifold is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a, a manifold without uh, boundary, uh, then uh, there would be no contribution from uh, that uh, last term because uh, that's protein density. Exactly. But we're coming back. We ca we, we, we're coming back. And just let me sh make sure I've got. And and what have I missed here? Just a minute. One, two, Okay, so as we've discussed, as as uh, as Upman you said, this term here can be just turned into a total derivative. I, is a total derivative, therefore can be turned into uh, turned into a boundary term on the boundary. Okay, so it's an integral of a divergence of a vector field. So this term I'm going to call the bulk part of the action, and this term the boundary part. Okay, both parts will play a very important role. But for a moment, let me focus on the bulk part. No, there's a long story there. Uh, no, the answer is no. Okay, if you remember what the Gibbons-Hawking term does uh, was, it was uh, it was extrinsic curvature of the boundary. What suppose we sla we take our space time and think of it as a sp having a spatial boundary and a time boundary. We'll choose our time boundaries to be surface of constant time. Okay? Then this term cancels the extrinsic curvature on the time boundaries. Okay? But it does not cancel the extrinsic curvatures on the spatial boundaries. You see that's reasonable, right? Because this term is the normal vector for with respect to these time surfaces. So it has something to do with extrinsic curvature of constant time surfaces. But it's nothing to do with the normal vector of this surface. So it doesn't have much to do with that. But it also does something there. What it does is change the extrinsic curvature of that surface in space time to the extrinsic curvature of a slice, a constant t slice of that surface in space. Do you understand? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, this whole story, I'm afraid, is a bit complicated. <laughs> okay, but let, let's go. Let's go through it at general level, and then we'll come. Yeah, but uh, let me explain. So, what we had was this boundary. Okay, I've drawn it weakly so that you can see it has some extrinsic curvature. Now, this is a three-dimensional manifold. Yes. Spatial manifold. This is a three-dimensional space-time space manifold. Two plus one-dimensional manifold. Okay, and it has a two plus one a, viewed as a two plus one dimensional manifold embedded in a three plus one dimensional space. It has a, an extrinsic curvature, and the Gibbons-Hopkins term was the integral of square root h. Why, the, why, why is this space time and not not a space manifold? Because you know, it's like constant, some surface of constant r far away. This is a spatial. Yeah, because it includes d by dt, which was time length. Hmm. Okay, yeah. So, so what we have here, a, so the, the Gibbons-Hawking term was the extrinsic curvature of this manifold viewed as a submanifold in the full four-dimensional space. Okay, now what we've done is break this up into slices. So in particular, we break the boundary, you know, these slices touch the boundary. Yeah. And the whole point of our exercise is to go from thinking in terms of space time to thinking slice by slice. So there is a separate notion here, which is here we've got a two plus one dimensional space. Okay? 
uh, sorry, here we've got a two dimension, uh, we've got a three dimension space, three spatial dimension space with a two spatial dimensional boundary. Yes. So that is a separate geometrical problem, one that has its own extrinsic curvature. Yes. And what the, the role in life of this term will be to change when added to the extrinsic curvature, the space time extrinsic curvature, will turn it into this spatial extrinsic curvature. So even the boundary term will become like a given Hawking term, but slice by slice. Uh, we'll come to that in, in five minutes. Okay? But at the moment, let us focus on the mark. That will be very important because it, it, it will be what determines, we'll see. Okay, now the next thing is to take, um, uh, to take all these quantities and to work them out with our particular choice of metric. Okay, so you remember what our metric was? Our metric was ds squared was equal to n times minus n times dt squared plus n squared, n squared thank you dya plus a a into dy b uh, na plus and also dh yes and b uh, times h a b okay now you know there's sort of a, the as many indices in h a b as there are in k a b so you might think that be that if I re I, if I just worked out what KAB was for this form of the metric, okay, uh, I would be able, I, I would be able to relate it to HAB, and that turns out to be the case. So let me tell you about those relations. Uh, When you work, you just work out the definition of what KAB is. This is an easy exercise. And you find KAB is 1 over 2n. Exactly. Where this tilde, is on tilde is in this H A B manifold. Okay. So this K A B is apart from this little extra piece, like a proxy for H A B dot. Okay, so it's like the time derivative. Okay, it's like the time derivative of H A B. Okay, and R three, of course, involves no dots because R three is the uh, Ricci scalar on, the three slice. on a given three slice. So for as far as it's concerned, T is some parameter. T is never differentiated. Okay. So this uh, this equation here makes manifest all the time derivative dependence in the bulk part of the action. 
Okay? This is time independent because it's completely in the metric HAB. This, of course, has the, uh, the time derivatives. So they all come from here and here. Now that we have the time derivatives staring us in our face, okay, we can compute the canonical momenta. So we're going to take this time as our time and perform the canonical formula, work with the canonical formulation of general relativity. And the uh, time derivative in the boundary term will go to zero because the reason is correct. The time derivative in the boundary term will go to zero for the reason I explained. And, and anyway, at the moment we're just focusing on the bulk. Boundary will come later. Okay. So, so now we can e evaluate the canonical momenta. Okay, and let me find the formula. Go on. Uh, so, 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 uh, can they depend on time, you're asking? Yes, sure. Everything can depend on time. Okay. However, as you see, I, I think this is what is behind your question, even though these are things that depend on time, their time derivatives do not enter into the Lagrangian. They give constraints. Okay, that's going to be very important. Okay. But uh, uh, sorry for the disorganized nature, but let me just give you this PAB. So you compute PAB. Okay? The derivative of the, uh, you know, derivative of the Lagrangian with that the respect. No, no. This is the momentum conjugate oh, okay. to HAB. Okay, okay. Okay. PAB is, you know, del L, uh, del L by del HAB, uh, probably with the square root G uh, by, by square root G. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 not even with the, with the square root G, because we really want it to be for the full action. You know, the full, it's just take the, the action is equal to square root G times Lagrangian. So whatever enters here, take that and differentiate it with respect to HAB, HAB dot. Because those are the rules for can canonical formulation, right? Whatever appears inside your integral, differentiate it with respect to that dot. Okay, so this quantity um, is equal to square root h times k a b minus k times h a b. Okay, where h a b of course is the inverse of, uh, where this h a b is the inverse of this h, that h a b. Exactly, I should have told you that. As uh, Pranoy said, square root g is equal to n times square root h. You might think it's more complicated, but it's not. You see, because for computing square root g, there are no derivatives involved. So you can locally shift coordinates to a y tilde, which gets rid of this. For the purpose of computing square root g, that's okay. And therefore, it's a di effectively diagonal. Hmm. So it's quite, so it's a, so yeah. Very stupid question, but the PAB is defined as uh, del S del HAB dot or del S del KAB? Del S del HAB dot. So uh, delta S is equal to, by definition, PAB, uh, PAB times uh, delta HAB dot. With no square root G or anything. I mean, exactly that definition. Okay? So this is a very important thing. This quantity here, this KAB minus K times HAB is the momentum conjugate to H and will play a very important role in what, for what follows. This combination will appear, this combination k minus k times metric appears all over the place. Okay, and uh, uh, something to get used to. Okay? So, in term, uh, if I try to uh, think of it uh, physically, what does HAB dot represent? I mean, uh, how 
it's how th how the metric is changing in time. The spatial part of the metric is changing in time, right? So physically, exactly, roughly speaking, what are the dynamical variables of your system? It's the three metric. Of course, there's the whole four metric, but the difference between the three metric and the four metric is four components. Which is G zero anything, and you've got four coordinate invariances. So the really physical quantities are the three metric, and the role of physics is to predict how this guy evolves in time. Roughly, that's how you should think of it. Okay. So H A B dot is like Q dot. So H A B is like Q, and H A B dot is like Q dot. Okay. <laughs> However, we have to do it all more more precisely. So let's let, let, let's 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 keep going. Okay. Now, uh, let me write down this line. Now the next thing that one does is take this Hamiltonian, um, take this Hamiltonian thought of as a function of coordinates and momentum. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thought of as a function of co uh, coordinates. Uh, 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 well, forget. No, no Hamiltonian. Let, let, take this action. Just thought of as a function of coordinates. Thought of as a function of GAB. Okay. N A and N. These are our, the fields that enter our our our, uh, our Lagrangian. Okay. What one does is take this form of the action, plug in this metric, and compute the variation of the of the action with respect to G A B, with respect to N A, and with respect to N. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you what comes out of that. All these are long and complicated calculations, but I'm going to tell you what comes out of that. Mm. Here. When one does this, one finds the following. Delta of S. Just, just one second. Ah. Just, just one second. Okay, okay. Let me just follow how, uh, the way he goes. The next thing this guy does, th this guy does, is now compute. Uh, we've, we've got this canonical momenta. Now he computes the Hamiltonian. Okay. So what's the definition of the Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian is H A B dot P A B minus L. 
minus whatever square root gn. OK, it computes it on a time slice. And let's see what we get. So he computes the Hamiltonian and gets the following quantity. Well, what I want to do is to compute everything that's inside the integral. What you normally do is to say that the action is integral dt L. Okay? Here we normally say integral dt square root gl. So this whole thing is the Lagrangian density, whatever. I mean, it's whatever's inside the whole is the Lagrangian. Yes. So it's integrated over the four volume. Over the well. This will now be integrated over a spatial slice. Okay. Right. Uh, this will be integrated over a spatial slice, and we'll see explicitly what, what this is now. Oh, where is it gone now? So, ah. N times KBKB uh, minus K minus uh, k squared minus r3, okay, minus 2 n a k a b minus k h a b, um, and then covariant variable of this minus 2 n a n del d of this. Everything here has a square root h, okay. So square root h is multiplies everything. Square root h and d3u. Um, uh, and then there is some boundary business, which we'll worry about later. Okay. Great. Is this, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just writing down lots of formulas for you. The point will become clear soon. Okay. Um, fine. Then the next thing we do is to take this Hamiltonian and look at its, the variation of the Hamiltonian. Okay. Look at the variation of the Hamiltonian with respect to, uh, uh, with respect to the momenta and the coordinates. Okay, so look at this. Uh, look at the next equation I'm going to write down. Delta H is equal to um, P A. I'll tell you what this is in a moment. Delta H A B plus it's a new thing. It's a curly. P -A -B. I'll, I'll tell you what that is in a moment. Uh, plus curly h a b delta p a b okay minus c times delta n minus 2 c a times delta n a okay. i'm going to tell you what these two are in just just a minute but for now what i want you to focus on uh, uh, is on the this uh, on these objects there's no momentum corresponding to capital N and N because that time derivative, as we saw, didn't appear there, yeah. appear in the Lagrangian. So the momentum corresponding to those guys are just zero. So you can't vary those momenta. 
Okay. And what is C? C was this combination that we saw before. Um, it was that R C is R three plus k square minus k a b k a b. And C A is also a combination we've seen before, which is del B of k a b minus k times del b. Now, where are we going with all this? Um, as all of you know, Hamilton's equations of motion are up to sign that del h by del p is q dot and del h by del q is p dot. There's a minus sign somewhere there. Okay, Better in terms of Poisson brackets, but we, we won't get into all that. The point here is that del h by del n has to be the time derivative of the momentum conjugate to n. But the momentum conjugate to n was 0, so its time derivative is safely 0. So, so this whole system, this simpler way of saying it in Lagrangian terms, the, uh, the whole system is only consistent if c is 0 and if c a is 0. Okay, Which is another way of saying that the variation of this Hamiltonian with respect to n and n a must just vanish. Okay, And therefore we find the following two constraints, constraint equations. Okay, This is the first really important thing we've come across here. So far we've been juggling around and fooling around. What we see here is now very important. You see, why is it so important? This stuff, as we have seen, is all a function of HAB and HAB dot. Right? K we were able to write in terms of uh, HAB dot. Of course, there are HABs all over and contractions and so on. HAB makes an explicit appearance here. So everything here is a function of HAB and HAB dot. So in answer to Manu's question about what's basically going on, what I had said is the basic variables of the problem are the metric on the three surface and its time derivative. Those are to be thought of like q and q dot. Now if we literally had q and q dot, what would be the structure of the equations of motion? The structure of the equations of motion would be that I specify q and q dot for you at one time. And physics tells you what happens at all future times. That's what we're used to. Now what are these equations? These equations, the equations that come from here, which will be of that form. They, are, they will be equations of the form that will tell you given q and q dot, and that is given HAB and HAB dot. It will tell you what HAB Neville dot is. It will help acceleration in terms of positions and velocities. But what about these equations? What is the structure of these equations? The structure of these equations is that there are four equations as identities that have to be obeyed between HAB and HAB dot. That is valid in every slice, though, as I will explain to you, there's a beautiful relationship, beautiful factor about Einstein's equations. That if these relations are valid on one slice, and these, the other equations of motion, the equations of motion that come from here, are valid everywhere, then these relations will automatically be valid on every slice. So, but there will be some kind of charge from that. Yeah, it's, ju it's that the time derivative of these relations is proportional to these relations. And therefore, if the relations are valid on one slice, they're valid on the next slice, and therefore on the next slice, and so on. Okay? So these are called Einstein's constraint equations. Okay? And I want to take two minutes just to look at their structure. This equation here has the form of a conservation equation on the slice. What is conserved on the slice? Well, a symmetric tensor. 
this um, symmetric, no, not traceless because there's no D involved. You see, had there been like a D minus one, it would have been traceless. Okay, but uh, uh, it's a symmetric tensor on this slice. This symmetric tensor, sometimes called a name, sometimes called the brown York stress tensor. Okay, and uh, one, one, one for formal purposes, you can think of this as an effective, no claim that this is the real stress tensor, but an effective stress tensor on this slice. Okay, and the equations of motion, the, con the constraint equation, this constraint equation is that the brown york stress tensor on any, every constant t slice is conserved. Now I want to remind you that there was nothing special about our choice of t. Our choice of the function t may await no specially good properties. Okay, and therefore, you know, given any 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 submanifold, I can choose some some foliation of space-time to include that submanifold. The fact that this brown york stress tensor is conserved on constant t slices. Therefore, means that the Brown York stress tensor, and notice that it's a local equation, that conservation. It means that the Brown York stress tensor is conserved on any time like slicing of, uh, any whatever space like slicing of, uh, of our manifold. So, we've discovered something very interesting about Einstein's equations. That it's, of course, this is something you didn't have to use the canonical formulation for. You could process Einstein's equations themselves, all the information is there. But it brings it out. It brings out the information that you take any slicing of Einstein's equation, you define by this formula the Brown York stress tensor on that slicing. You will get that uh, on that slicing it's a conserved stress tensor. This is the first constraint equation. Why is it a constraint? It means that from, from the point of view of time evolution, you cannot choose HAB and HAB dot independently. HAB and HAB dot can only be chosen so that they satisfy this, this equation. On initial, On initial conditions. This quantity here is sometimes called the Hamiltonian constraint. Okay? And uh, um, I have less intuition about what, how to think of this. It's the quantity that it tells you, well, you know, it's telling you that two quantities that are quadratic in time derivatives are related to some curvature type quantity. Um, roughly, it's telling you that the time derivatives cannot be scaled up. You know, you can't make time, time variation too fast or too slow, uh, all of them together, because then these, these quantities would get scaled up and this guy would stay fixed. So given a slice, is giving you one further constraint on how fast things can change in time in some complicated way. Uh, I don't have as good intuition for this quantity as I should. I don't really know how to think of it so well. But, uh, but that's what this quantity is. Okay? So how many constraint equations do we have? We have four constraint equations. Okay? Uh, you guys are, usual, are probably familiar with the fact that it's a usual thing in gauge theories that you have as many constraints as gauge invariances. The fact that we had four constraints, simply the fact that we had four coordinate invariances in the end. Okay, great. So we've encountered our first really important fact about Einstein's. Uh, this has highlighted something very important. That Einstein's equations thought of as an initial value problem is a constrained problem. Okay, that data is HAB and HAB dot, but subject to Four constraints. Three of these constraints take the form of a conservation of a stress tensor, this brown york stress tensor on a constant t slice, and the fourth one is a more, more strange condition. That is of this form. Okay. See, all these constraints, yeah, they, yeah, yes, yes, yes. These constraints in the end. Yes, 
in the end there I, I don't know if you remember when we solved Schwarzschild Schwar solved for the Schwarzschild geometry we said well you know it looks like we've got more equations than variables okay but then we found that they actually didn't have more equations than variables okay um, yeah, these are all related statements okay but it would be hard I mean there's no I, I the relationship I would have to think hard to make precise you see because as you see this is you know something about a particular slicing whereas the Bianchi identities are about quantities defined in space time okay this it's a bit different but I, but I but I won't I won't say it's unrelated okay Let, let's keep going let's keep going for two three more minutes I know I'm going over time but let's let's go a little further okay then of course I have to tell you what this is maybe I'll postpone that to next class because these are less exciting things let me tell you the main point okay we've seen that CA and this C vanish but now let us look at the value the bulk part uh, bulk value of the Hamiltonian the bulk value of the Hamiltonian was n times C plus n a times not surprisingly then the bulk part of the Hamiltonian just vanishes when evaluated on shell in fact the fact that the variation of this with respect to n gave this is not unrelated to this statement it's like a delta function right you've got x suppose you have x times y uh, x times something in your your Hamiltonian uh, suppose your whole Hamiltonian is x times something and that's the only appearance of x then on shell the Hamiltonian vanishes because x the equation of motion with respect to x puts that something to zero KAB has n, KAB has n in it so that, that that's why it's not completely straightforward yes yeah, so you have to do some work okay but in the end that's how it works okay so now the 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 point is that this Hamiltonian here vanishes on shell more precisely the bulk part of the Hamiltonian vanishes on shell okay so if we're going to interpret the Hamiltonian as we should presumably as the energy of our system and we'll discuss next class under what conditions and so on we can do that okay then the Hamiltonian comes entirely from its boundary term so we've encountered the second thing that the notion of energy in the general theory of relativity is that of a boundary term now you might think this is sort of strange right if you take a minimally coupled scalar field you've got a bulk stress tensor you integrate it that's what gives you your energy how, how did energy suddenly become a boundary term well you can ask is there a precedent for this in a more familiar form of physics let's look at Maxwell's equations what is the notion of charge in Maxwell's equations in Maxwell's equations you have two notions of charge one is that more the familiar kind integral of J0 over space but by Gauss's law that is the same as the integral of E on the boundary of space there are two ways to measure charge in Maxwell dynamics one to just integrate E on the boundary second to do integral of J0 and by Gauss's law by whatever by Maxwell's equations these two give you the same same answer okay in general relativity it's taken one step further there is there is no coordinate invariant bulk stress tensor in general that can be integrated to give this boundary term okay it's like the boundary definition like the integral of E makes sense in general there's no bulk equivalent okay there are special situations when there is a bulk equivalent the special situation is when you could actually when you were a killing vector and some additional symmetries then you can write down what's called a Komar integral for the stress tensor we'll talk about that at some point 
okay but uh, for the general case the entire notion of energy in general relativity is that of a boundary term and that makes it very clear that we had better be very careful about all boundary terms. We, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it next class. But roughly speaking, the energy, I may not surprise you too much, will turn out to be integral of square root. Let k be the trace of the intrinsic curvature of the boundary of a slice. That's two-dimensional. Exactly. Let h tilde be the metric on the boundary of that slice. Then the, the, induced, metric, right? the induced metric, everything is, yes. Then the Hamiltonian up to some numbers and so on will turn out to be basically this, when, once we keep track of the boundary terms properly. Okay, so the way, to, way of computing energies in general relativity is to go far away to infinity and compute extrinsic curvature. How this makes sense and what it means, we, we'll, we'll come to. Why it gives you the right answer for short chain geometry, for instance. Uh, we'll come to. Okay. Then there are the less exciting things about the actual form of these equations of motion. I'll tell you them next class, but there's not that much qualitative we're going to learn. The main qualitative lessons that we wanted to learn, we've already come across. Okay. A, that general relativity as, a, oh, do you need the class? In one, one minute. Yeah. Yeah. General relativity views as, viewed as an initial value problem is a constraint system. The nature of the constraints are the form of the conservation of the Brownian stress tests at one stranger condition. And B, that the Hamiltonian and therefore the energy density in any coordinate invariant way vanishes in the bulk as purely a boundary term. So our, our goal next class will be to mo be more careful about the boundary. That will be our main goal and to carefully understand the boundary and from that pull out a clear notion of energy and let's say angular momentum and things like that in general relativity. That will be uh, the, main, uh, uh, the main, main, main goal for the next class. Okay. okay, I'm sorry about the switch in nature of the class where we are, we've moved to the seminar mode. If anyone feels a very un any uncomfortable about any particular thing, we will go through that next class. However, I would advise you guys not to obsess about the details of this stuff. Because it's complicated and in the end it's algebra. If you would like that, I could do it. Okay? They're very clear. They're very clearly given in this book by Poisson. Okay, I'll put at least three or four of them into the assignments just to give you a flavor of how, uh, of, of, of how things go. Uh, 